Good morning, good morning, good afternoon almost. I appreciate you guys for staying around. I, um, I was telling a lot of people um, I've been on the last day of a conference before, and so I've started telling people, like, when they ask, like, when are you speaking? Um, I like, look, don't tell me if you can't stay, because a lot of times you get like, uh, I can't stay that late. So I'm like, look, just shh, thank y'all for coming. <laughs> anyway, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, yeah, I'll tell you about me. Um, like she said, um, I got a pretty religious background, uh, Jehovah's Witness, uh, with my with my dad, once my mom and my dad separated, um, I started going to my father's like the family church, which was the Methodist church. So I went through the whole confirmation process there. I was, you know, singing and all that stuff. But where things got really crazy, as you can imagine, is when um, I got into the you know evangelical charismatic type stuff. Um, and that's where I was ordained as an evangelist. I was a prophetess. When you come see me at the table, I can offer you a prophecy as well, if you want one. I'm just saying I was kind of good at it. Um, so anyway, that was that, okay? So my, my talk is about mental health, right? But one of the things that, um, one of the things that was troublesome um, was that I started having my own issues with mental health from a very, very, very young age. Um, I remember having panic attacks in the fourth grade, and I mean, fall out on the floor panic attacks, like I can't stand up panic attacks. Um, and so uh, what, what God ignored in my life, um, despite all that I was doing for him, was my mental health, my mental illness. Um, I've been diagnosed with bipolar two, um, which is a little bit different. It just means that it's heavy on the depression side. Um, bipolar one, you tend to see more heavy on the mania side. That's where people are like, you know, that's the stuff that you're used to seeing on TV, basically. Bipolar two is more heavy on the depression side, which is really heavy on the depression side. Um, there were some, I heard there was some, I saw some hands earlier or yesterday or whatever, that there were some neurologists here or whatever. Thank y'all for studying the brain. Thank you all who like formulate mental health meds. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's all I can say, okay? Um, and uh, yeah, okay. So, and I dealt with a lot of uh, suicidal ideations and urges as well, so that was also problematic. Um, but becoming an atheist was a very intellectual process for me, um, as many people no, many people say, right? It was not a I was mad at God kind of moment. It was an intellectual process. And so I went from this like, yeah, you know, like I can show you how to shout, shout too if you want. Anybody want a shouting lesson? I can give you a shouting lesson as well. Okay, like a black church shouting lesson, okay? Okay, so I knew how to do that. I could prophesy. And then, you know, we went to another church that was a little more mellow. You know, it still had the same messages, it was a little more mellow, and so, you know, okay, you know, yeah, okay, we still believe this stuff. Then we stopped going to church, so, you know, it was okay, God is, you know, still there's Jesus, the Holy Trinity, God, all that, yes, all that's still there. Then slowly, you know, it was like, there's something out there, but I don't know what it is, it's mysterious, but there's still something in the universe. Right, I went through that little phase. Um, and then, of course, I became the, don't you don't know if there's one, and you don't know if there ain't one, y'all can't say. I went through one of those little phases too. Okay, to where now, I'm on the American Atheist stage, wide open, so I'm kind of excited about that. And as she's, uh, as, um, where'd you go? I um, got the Secular Therapist Project, Clergy Project, all that stuff. Um, one of the things that, um, oh, my, my presentation's not on the thing? Okay, well, it's okay. One of the things that, uh, there we go, woo! Thank you all for technology. Um, one of the things, okay, is actually, most of y'all in here are probably a good, maybe not most, 
A good percentage of y'all, though, are just like me. Y'all crazy, too, okay? So, because one in five, when, oftentimes when we hear mental illness, we think the shit you see on TV. No, mental illness, I don't like that word either, but that's the range from anxiety, you know, a little bit of anxiety to um, I'm having a hard time adjusting to this new stage of life anxiety to, you know, schizophrenic, can't, you know, hearing voices, all of that stuff. So the range is wide. So when you see one in five, one in five imply, I mean, that just goes with the fact that there's just such a wide range in severity, right? Um, but you see the one in 25 dealing with a serious mental illness. Um, in mental health, we talk about severe and persistent mental illness, SPMIs. Those are the manic disorders. Those are the personality disorders. Those are the schizophreniform dis disorders. That's where you're seeing a lot of hallucinations, delusions. That's where you're getting a lot of that stuff. So that's that chronic, that's that severe. Okay, so that's one in 25, but we'll look at a little bit more closer statistics in a minute. And then half of all people with chronic, you know, illnesses, it be, uh, begins before 14. Um, if you think about me, right, I was having panic attacks before I was 14, right? So, there we go. We got only about 1.1% of the um, American population deals with the schizophrenia. Um, you see, we got our numbers there, 2.6% for bipolar. Um, that number for depression is pretty low, I think, as a mental health clinician. But again, I think that that is because people are afraid to, you know, they don't recognize that, what, that depression is such a range, you know. Um, and then, of course, anxiety disorders. I mean, anxieties are really prevalent everywhere but the, this this number right here um, mental illness we got to understand that you know this is a really really big impact on America on our society in a lot of ways right it's not just me it was the days that when I was a teacher and I was having panic attacks and I couldn't report to work right that's that two point that's that ten point two million, um, I'm sorry, uh, oh no, I'm sorry, next slide. Uh, Co-occurring disorders, that's like addiction and something else, right? A lot of people end up homeless, obviously they can't function, they can't go to work, you know, so they end up in the streets. A lot of times, again, if you see 10.2 million end up with um, a substance abuse issue, they've probably burnt bridges with families, they don't have anywhere to go. Um, and what's interesting is I did this talk in um, a similar, this similar talk in 2016, right? Um, I got these statistics, as you can see. It's, I got this from the uh, NAMI website, but it's actually CDC um, research. Uh, two years ago, that co-occurring addiction and mental health number was 8.2. So in two years, it's gone to 10.2. Um, of course, when we think about the opioid crisis, right, that kind of explains, I think, that, that big jump. Um, it, mental illness first leading calls in the world. That um, 193 billion, with a B, is what I was talking about when I was saying that has that negative impact on the economy overall, right, our overall function. And again, like I said, you know, when I was a teacher, and I was having panic attacks, and I couldn't go to work, you know, that was impact on the economy, right? Or when I just quit working all together because I just couldn't handle it, that was an impact on my family, I promise you it was, okay? My family was feeling it. I don't know if the American economy was feeling it, but my family was feeling it. Okay, um, I'm gonna look at this. Uh, suicide statistics here because uh, I got to move on. Um, I want to go back to the statistics first. <laughs> the statistics, okay. 
so let me, let me tell you these numbers about the first, second leading causes of death. Y'all gonna be surprised about this. Um, so suicide is the 10th leading cause of death overall in the United States, right? There are, there are nearly twice as many suicides as homicides. Twice as many suicides as homicides. That's deep. Ten, for, for 10 to 14 year olds, it is the second leading cause of death. Suicide is the second leading cause of death for 10 to 14 year olds? Suicide? Like, I don't understand that. Like, aren't they supposed, they supposed to be dying of other stuff? I don't want them to die at all, but they ain't supposed to be dying of suicide, right? It's the second leading cause of death for 15 to 25 year olds, which is up from the last time I gave this talk. It was the third leading cause the last time I gave this talk. Now it's the second leading cause for 15 to 24 year olds. It is the second leading cause again for 25 to 30 year olds, 25 to 34 year olds. Suicide, it is the second leading cause of death for ages 10 to 34. I don't know about you, but that boggles my mind and I'm the mental health clinician in the room. So see, all y'all crazy, right? That's what I said, cause y'all, all y'all, about half of y'all on Facebook right now. See, trying to be popular, trying to be popular. Okay, so when you make assumptions, I, I had this boyfriend in high school, he used to say that, we well, don't be quick making assumptions. When you make assumptions, you make an ass out of you and me. It's like, shut up, dude, shut up, motherfucker. Okay, <laughs> I tell him to this day, shut up, motherfucker, forget you. Okay. So religiousness has frequently been found um, to be associated with higher reported mental health levels, right? And, but that's what we always hear in the research, but the problem is we don't usually include secular, non-believing populations in a lot of those studies. And so as we know, you're not gonna know what we think if you don't talk to us. Um, John Moore and Mark Leach. Uh, John Moore is the sort of guy who's leading a lot of research on happiness in the secular community. So you can look him up. He's got a lot of good stuff out there. If you don't, if you haven't heard of him, okay. The impaired mental health stigma against secular individuals is, at the very least, an uh, an exaggeration. Impaired mental health stigma. Right, that, that something is wrong with all of us. Right, of course we know that's not accurate. Um, again, this is what they had to say. So they did a study. So um, John Moore, with the assistance of Mark Leach, um, he did a study. This was his PhD dissertation, if I'm not mistaken. That many people, so finally we got a majority of secular non-believers in that uh, population. And I like the way in his study, he, he literally said, a smattering of adherence to other faiths. I was like, okay, a smattering. Okay, so atheistic and theistic groups, really honestly, they show no difference on four out of five mental health indicators. Four out of five, there was really no big difference, okay? Secular and religious adherents have similar levels of mental health. Don't let people tell you otherwise. When people say the, the research says, it's because the research does not include us. When we're included, this is what we find out. It's the same, okay? But what is interesting is there's this sort of what's called a curvilinear relationship, right? Absolute certainty in God's existence and absolute certainty in God's non-existence 
are the ones where they have the similar um, levels of mental health, okay? But what they found is um, that sort of, mid the, the more unsure you are, either as a, as a non-believer or as a believer, the height of that, you know, if we're talking mental health, poor mental health is up high, the height of our little curvilinear line is on the highest levels of mental illnesses. It uh, actually falls on the people who are more unsure, the people who are kind of floundering, or, they, or, or they're just not fully committed to anything in particular. You know, so actually the more sure you are, the more healthy you are. So see, we actually should be the healthiest people because we've already decided, like we know like we're atheists, like we're done, okay. But the truth of the matter is the research says, you know, all of y'all crazy, basically. Doesn't matter which side you fall on. If you're in the middle, you're horrible. But, so what does it say? So I'm gonna just give a quick, you know, just a, a couple of quick examples, or really one quick example from the Bible um, of something that I think uh, is part of the reason why um, secular, I mean, uh, religious communities have such a uh, um, negative vibe or a negative attitude towards treating mental health. When I was in the church, um, you know, I was told, pray, you know, I was, let me get to it. Okay, so if you have a mental health problem, these are the things that the church, according to the church, right? You either have a lack of faith, right? So I'm going to tell you this story. Here's the scripture. If you can't see it, Asa, in his 39th year of his reign, was diseased in his feet until his disease was exceeding great. What is that, like gout? Or maybe something, like he may have had diabetes or something. Bon, I mean, who could have, <laughs> right? Yeah, the disease, bone spurs, or something. Right, 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 bone spurs. I, I, I got you now, right, bone spurs. <laughs> Yet in his disease, he sought not to the Lord, but to the physicians. Mm -mm. See, that was your first mistake. You went to them damn doctors, okay? We told you to seek the Lord, all right? And so guess what? Asa died. So they link this thing. I mean, in the 39th year of his reign, so I'm assuming this man is probably kind of old if he's already been reigning for 40 years, right? So, but no, the cause of death was not praying, okay? Um, or another potential cause that a uh, reason that a person might be going through these things is that God is just intentionally testing you. Of course, we know the whole Job story. And that one, if that one's not the sickest one, right? What about my man Joe? How about that? Let me holler at him. You know what I'm saying? See, that, do what you can do to Joe. Give him your worst. He kept, like, that was the worst part. If you haven't read Job, man, he kept going back, Satan kept going back to God and being like, man, I'm throwing all this shit at Job, but Job ain't breaking. Job, God's like, yo, you ain't trying hard enough. Like, give, like, like dig deep. You the devil. You got some good tricks in your bag. So then the devil would go back, I mean, and he'd just throw more and more and more. Then he'd go back to God and be like, yo, this dude is still praising your name. I don't get it. So could be part of it is, you know, God is just testing you. And then, of course, my favorite of all is faith healing. I can do that as well. Meet me at the table. For a low, low cost of one book, I will heal you of all of your infirmities, okay? Heal the sick, right? Cleanse lepers, raise the dead, all right? This gives God a chance to give you a healing. And if you don't have enough faith to trust that he's going to, you know, heal you, 
you know, you had so well. You know what I'm saying? You could try them those anti those antidepressants if you want to, but that's not where. The, and I remember, I remember um, a personal story. I remember um, I was I was going through a really bad bout of depression. I was an evangelist or whatever I was in the church, and I was going. I was in a horrible, horrible bout, horrible place, and. Um, and so I it, like I was so bad, like in the middle of the night, bad. And so my pastor is like, "Come on over here, you know, you and your husband, come over. We're gonna perform a deliverance. You know, that's like an exorcism, basically." And so, so I get a, I get a. I'm gonna explain this into in a minute. I get a trash bag, right? And as he's praying, oh, get out of her, devil, a demon of depression, you demon of mental illness, you all, da 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 da. He's like, the, 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 the deliverance process, if you don't know, involves coughing. So, and sometimes, you know, you need this bag because sometimes the demon will come up as like, throw up. You know, not the fact that you, that they keep, that they're making you cough as hard as you can over and over and over, that has nothing to do with you coughing up shit. That's the devil coming out. So if, if you vomit in this bag, that's a good sign. You just got a devil out. I ain't vomit in the bag. So unfortunately, they didn't get the depression demon out of me. But uh, anyway, this is what mental illness looks like in the Bible. It's just a quick, one quick example. Uh, so they went across the lake. Let me just go on down. All right, Mark 5, 118, okay? So they go across this lake. A man, uh, Jesus get out of the boat, and a man with the impure spirit comes out of the tombs to meet him. Now, this man's lived in chains, but no one really could bind him, not even the chains. He's, like, ripping out of chains all the time. Right, and he had chains to everything. Uh, they just could not subdue him day and night among the tombs and the hills. He cried, he carried on, he cut himself with the stones. He was just out of control. And when he saw Jesus, he fell and shouted, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of, uh, uh, son of the most high God? In God's name, don't torture me. And so Jesus supposedly, apparently, immediately recognized what was going on with this man. Again, the man had a demon. All we need to do is cast the demon out. And guess what? Dude's all better. All right? So this story was Mark 5. Well, we see this story also in Luke. Same story. When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man. Okay? Oh, he, this man, in this version, he was naked, okay? He lived naked. He lived, uh, he hadn't lived, in, he hadn't worn clothes or lived in the house, all right? Same thing, he fell to Jesus' feet. Uh, and this is the Mark 8 version of the same story, Matthew 8. Um, basically, same stuff, same stuff. This is the funny one, though, because it's not funny. I, I'm sorry, let me take that back. It's not funny. This is the one where he clarifies that, well, what do we do with those all those demons, right? They got to go somewhere. So they go into the pigs, and then the pigs jump off of a ledge and kill themselves, like, what well, devil, like, the demon's like, now you just killed your other source of, like, where you gonna live now? Now you got to float up, now you got to float around and haunt around to find some more people to get into. I'm like, I never understood why the demons made the swine jump over the hill, because that was their next place to live. That was like their new home. I ain't get it. I never got that story. Okay, but what really gets me is if you look down um, and... It says, and they that kept them fled. They went into the city and told everyone everything. So the, they that kept them, you mean the swine owners. You mean the swine owners who you have now 
taking away all of their ability to live, all of their, you know, like that's their business. And, and now they got to run off and, like, advertise you as well. Like, you sure is an arrogant-ass motherfucker. Like, you going to kill my shit, and now you want me to run and advertise for you? Because you come at that town? That's what they supposed to do, though. Okay, but this is what I see. I see a man having psychosis. Okay, I see a man with depression, self-harm, isolation. He's homeless. He's probably burnt, if he's up there acting like that, he's probably burnt a million bridges. He don't have any more friends or family that want to help take care of him. If you, I promise you, I've been in the presence of live, active, hardcore, going at it psychosis. And it can be some scary shit. It really, really can. But you can't throw those people away. But, you know, again, if this man was in a violent place like that, you know, back then, again, they didn't have meds like we had, so he was being violent. What are we going to do with him? Well, no. <laughs> That's why I always been one of my favorite memes. <laughs> so then why are we so happy? Like, if we don't have God... Why are we so happy then? Like, what is there to be? What is there to be happy about? I've been thinking about how, like, as we walk around this hotel, you know, we got our lanyards on, so people are recognizing, like, okay, that's that convention. And there've been a couple times where, you know, like, I kind of sort of felt like maybe, like, I spoke to you. Like, did you not speak to me? Cause I had on a red lanyard. Like, but. I've been, I'm, it's nice to see that we're all in here and we're all laughing and we're smiling and we're being kind to the staff and we're being kind to other people. You get on the elevator, oh, excuse me, yes. Like, that's the kind of shit that makes, you know, they see us in here happy. Like, we're not doing anything to anybody and we're still being nice to y'all and everything. So, I mean, you should be thanking me for being nice to you because we could be up in here plotting against you. Apparently, that's what you think, right? But no, no, that's, that's what I'm talking about to the people. Okay, so Dan Barker, right? He said this, life has no meaning. Um, oh, look, if not, it's hard, it may be hard for y'all to see, but if not for Halloween, Easter would be my favorite zombie-related holiday. <laughs> Do you know how many times I totally forgot that t this was Easter weekend? Like, it takes people saying Easter weekend, and I'm like, oh, yeah, it is Easter. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> okay? This is, you know, these are, these are the types of things. Happy atheists. I, don't, I believe in life before death. Right? You can't see that one down in the corner. I don't know, the Atheist Wine Club. Does it say something? Maybe? Yeah. Okay. Athe just some pretty flowers, right? Just pretty shit. Okay, I'm an atheist, but I still love pregnant. I mean, ooh, oh no, what I do? Oh, look at me. Mm. Okay, so life, uh, yeah, oh, let me keep on moving. Uh, what does that one say? One advantage of uh, an atheist boyfriend is that he worships only me. <laughs> yes, yes. And I was an atheist until I found out that I was a sex god. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Okay, it's a strange myth that atheists have nothing to live for. It's the opposite. We have everything to, to die for. I mean, we have nothing to die for. We have everything to live for. Right? It's one of my favorites. So how do we address mental illness? I'm running out of time. Professional interventions. You know, go get some help. Go talk to somebody. You know, don't be afraid to take meds. I mean, even among people as open-minded and free-thinking as we are, you still get people who are like, oh, I don't want to get dependent on. Well, you going to walk around and be depressed off and on your whole life? I'd rather be dependent on the pill that's going to keep me from being depressed my whole life. How about that? I'll take the pill, okay? But you know what? Shock therapy is a new thing. It's coming back out. It's actually kind of interesting. Okay? I talk about smoking weed all the time. There's a lot of research. I, we laugh about it, but there is legit a lot of research, especially um, when uh, working with PTSD. 
um, and severe trauma, anxiety. Um, just don't worry, just talk about it. Talk about it, right? Don't be afraid to talk about it. Don't be afraid to talk about your own struggles. Don't be afraid to talk to people who are having struggles. You know what I'm saying? How, like, I can stand up on a stage right now and tell you that I'm bipolar and I take pills. And I'm like, and I'm probably happier than you. You know what I'm saying? Like, I feel good today. Okay? You know what I'm saying? So, these are the things that I like to do. Shout out. Hey, Daryl took me hiking in California, I mean Colorado. These are healthy things, right? I'm telling you healthy stuff to do. And so he took me hiking in Mount Crested Butte. I went to 12,000 feet, y'all. I made it up there. What are we doing this summer? 14,000? 14,000 this summer. I literally will hug a tree because I hike every Sunday. I, every weekend, if you're a Facebook friend of mine. However, the shit is scary sometimes. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> this shit is scary. And that one right there with the ladder, that ladder had ice on it. I went to 6,000 feet. By the time I got to 6,000 feet, it was snow and ice. But I climbed that ladder with ice on it by myself. Um, but, you know, sometimes you got to take a friend. Some of y'all know Kim Ellington, perhaps. That's my homegirl. But you know what I'm saying? Ultimately speaking, when you're dealing with your mental health, you got to find your own path, right? You got to figure out something to do. Address it. Don't let it flounder. Don't let it just sit. Because the atheist and the non-believer, I mean, the non-believers and the believers, our levels of depression are not... Be, you know, are not worse. They're the same. You know what I'm saying? Get the help that you need, if you need help. But also be aware that it's, it's really bad out there. I mean, it really is pretty bad mental health-wise, and we really have to figure out how to support each other and how to, you know, support others. Okay? So there are mental health resources, suicide hotline, NAMI is a big one, and SAMHSA are big ones. If you can't remember two, if you can't remember them all, think NAMI, N-A-M-I, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, um, and SAMHSA, that is uh, like a subsidiary of the CDC, essentially, sort of like. Okay? All right. So, I appreciate you all for staying around. <laughs>